Hello Mercenaries, this is Carolyn and you are listening to Merc News, this week marks a time of grief. The devastation caused by the clan invasion has turned the inner sphere into a scene of terror, we have lost contact with both House Girita and the Free Raslahog Group Public, their capital planets have been overrun, the clans greatly outnumber defending units and the technology they possess is something mech warriors cannot prepare for. Conflict between Avian and Kirita continues, but clans go spare and Smoke Jaguar are charging into their territory. Now the Draconis Combine is nearly split in two. However, Pass Kirita has formed a high council composed of leaders from their strongest military units. This unification of leadership may help them, but it could be too little too late. The Free Rasselhog Republic is being hit by three clans at once. Ghost Bear, Wolf, and even Jade Falcon. The faction has been pushed to the edge of their territory. Many units have begun to leave the faction now that the pay has run low and morale has run lower. House Merrick continues their war campaign conquering every planet they pass. The BWC unit is only two planets away from being the most accomplished unit in the sphere. Merrick could reach the clan front soon, and if that happens the tides may change. After speaking with Merrick leaders we were not met with anger and bloodlust, rather, we were shown culture and kindness the units of the Free Worlds League share with each other. Many of the unit leaders reach out to smaller mercenary units to help them and encourage them, some of them were extremely religious and encouraged us to hear the word of a man named Blake, however, some believe the faction plans to push against the clans and conquer the inner sphere while they do it, but which is worse, clans or Merrick? House Steiner has also received increased attacks from Clan Jade Falcon. Steiner's losses are great but the faction continues to hold back the clan. There are no massive units in the faction to unify them, instead smaller units and lone wolves work together for form a defensive against the invasion, but their forces are split, fighting on both fronts. Join us next week and keep up to date on all things in the Inner Sphere and Merc status. My name is Carolyn and this has been Merc News. Merc News is a Beer Warriors production. Check them out at beerwarriors.net. This episode is brought to you by the Aces Mercenary Unit. From casual pug groups to full 12-man community warfare drops, Aces may have what you're looking for. For more information or just to say hi, visit aces-hq.com or drop in on their channel on the NGNG Outreach Team Speak 3 server today. If your unit would like to sponsor a podcast, contact me at bombadil at nogutsnogalaxy.net. No Guts No Galaxy is recorded in front of a live studio audience. This is an adult podcast containing adult language. Consider yourself warned. You're listening to the Game Casting Broadcast Network. <laughs> Live from the outreach studios around the world, this is a No Guts, No Galaxy podcast. And now, your host, Phil, a.k.a. Sean Lang. the No Guts, No Galaxy podcast 129. My name is Phil, and I'm your host. Today is January 28th, 2015. Holy crap, 2014 is really gone. I'm joined by Darren and today's co-host, Brandon Tyler. What's going on, Darren? How are you? I am doing well. I uh, just got out of a little meeting looking at the uh, weekend update for this coming weekend. A couple of really cool previews, hopefully, I think, that are going to be making into it. So if you haven't been checking out the official MWO weekend updates, go to their YouTube page. Check them out. This weekend is going to be a pretty cool one. Mech porn? Any... Mech porn. Oh, yes. And yes. <laughs> All right. What about you, Brandon? How have you been? Cold and snowy. Uh, last night, I had to go into work after it just finished snowing, and we got, I think, about 16 inches of snow down. Sounds about right. And nothing's plowed at all. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. That's going to say that's a pretty average thing for you about this time of year, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, we got we got 16 inches down yesterday. Uh, tonight we're getting about another inch, and then the day after we're getting probably about another four inches, and then I think over the weekend we're supposed to be getting some something along the lines of another 10 inches. So it's gonna be good. It's a lot of fun. Well, luckily the mech that you travel back and forth to work in can tromp right through that shit. Oh, I just put mask on and then take my hands off the wheel and just kind of there you go. Kinda let let it do its own thing. You guys are nerds, just saying. Tyler, Nerd. what about you, man? How have you been? Doing okay. Just taking a break here before I have to go forth into the real world. How many years of break? <laughs> How many <laughs> years of break? I don't know. Streaming full time. I was going to say, okay. you know, now that you're uh, a civilian out of college, just just go back and get your master's, dude. It's totally worth it. I still have time on the GI Bill. I could do it. But All no, right. fuck that. I'm tired of it. <laughs> tired of it? <laughs> I'm t- yeah, I got tired of exams, that's pretty much. But uh, anyways, let's go jump into things. Got some special guests tonight. Uh, I want to introduce you guys. Uh, I'll go ahead and go through the names really quick. You guys know them as Ghost, Alexander Wolf, and Sans Dalius. Is that Daedalus. Oh, Daedalus. Daedalus. Sans Daedalus, which Daedalus. I guess means without Daedalus. He can, he can expand on that. I don't know. But uh, these guys are from the Bear Net Podcast. You guys... Uh, been around for a while i've listened to you quite often as darren and anyways figured it was time to sit you guys down say hello introduce yourselves all that fun stuff so uh i guess ghost do you want to be the first one to say hello sure uh name's jeremy also known as ghost and definitely running the baronet awesome show you guys should check it out excellent and i am greg uh also known as alexander wolf uh we've been doing it for oh about half a year now uh having a lot of fun with it uh bit of a unique format and we think it works pretty well for us well we're going to get more details from you but first to clarify the pronunciation on his name mr daedalus (laughs) it is sans daedalus yes and uh my real world name is tyler you i'm you can call me by that it's no bother to me but uh yeah how long have we been doing the baronet now ghost about what half a year Mm. i think we're on podcast 32 or so so a little over a little over half a year 33 Yep. Yeah. Excellent. And I did, I, I was there, uh, like Phil said, we're both fans of the podcast. Now, um, we're calling it a podcast, but it's a stream. It's a whatever. It's you talking, playing, and uh, people being able to watch. But why don't you give us the details? I think, Alexander, you're going to do that. To, uh, let us know where we can watch you, when, where that video sh- you know ends up, if you can't make it live, etc. Uh, well, we broadcast every uh, Monday at 930 um, Eastern Time. Uh, on uh, on Twitch at uh, slash the uh, the Baronet, um, and uh, you know we we kind of do a, a bit of a unique thing where we you know we we drop throughout the show, but we're also kind of talking about either new things that happened the last week or so, uh, you know, in regards to you know announcements about what the upcoming patches are going to be. Um, if a new mech came out, we usually try to showcase that. So you know, a couple weeks ago when the King Crab came, well, I guess it's more than a month ago now, when the King Crab came out, you know, we dropped in King Crabs and Gargoyles for a few drops, and we tried to, you know, kind of do a bit of a showcase as long as well as uh, talking about whatever's happened in the community. Um, and if you can't ch- catch the show at uh, 9.30 Eastern on Mondays, we also do have a YouTube channel where we upload everything over there as well. Um, we're in the process of streaming a bit more during the week and whatnot, and, you know, in the future, we, we hope to be coming at you uh, multiple times during the week. Why don't you uh, give us that YouTube URL? No, I'm just joking. It's a it's a long convoluted <laughs> URL. <laughs> it'll be it'll be in the show notes. So if you want to check that out, I'd highly recommend it. Check out the uh, last few episodes. I'm sure you'll fall in love with it, and then you'll want to be there live for the next one. I was gonna say what's a little bit different too for those that uh, maybe haven't checked it out, but uh, they're playing MWO while they're talking. So I would say a little bit more coordination sometimes they get off on rants as much as like we do but it's because they're shooting stuff at the time so anyways it's really enjoyable and um so yeah make sure to uh check it out and i just want to say guys uh keep it up i mean it's always good having other podcasts out there and you know especially offers a different perspective different point of view and obviously you know I you're think not it shows. shills yeah you're totally not shills and you know all that. <laughs> no but um No, it's awesome. And like I said, thank you again, guys, for being a part of the community and adding something to it. It's another thing I can't stress is actually uh, people being constructive. Oh, appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's going to move us into the discussion topics. Phil, take it away. All right, so moving on. And of course, chime in whenever you guys want. But uh, we haven't really talked about this stuff. And I felt uh, it was about time. 
And one of those is, let's talk about MWO in the post-community warfare release area. I mean, we, we've been doing roundtables. We've been sitting down. I think the last podcast was about community warfare mostly. And I think it's, it's, it's time to talk about just the game and uh, refocus our attention on that. So the first topic we're going to be doing is solo and group random matches versus community warfare. And um, I guess the question is, are, are they both viable and fun? Uh, you know, do they still need development? Um, Tyler, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on the solo and group random matches versus community warfare? What are you enjoying the most and what would you like to see worked on? Well, I'm still having a, a blast with Community Warfare, actually. It's still something fresh and new. I've played the game a lot, like you guys have. And it's just nice to have something new to do. So they're still expanding Community Warfare. I'm uh, looking forward to a new map here next month. And yeah, that's great. But the the open games the open games are still fine, fun. I still have a good time playing those. And it would be nice to have a few new maps. We got a couple new ones just recently. Uh, Viridian Bog and Mining Collective. But it's always good to see that. And maybe a, a new game mode or two would be welcome as well. What about you, Darren? I mean, how, how are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, you know I've been playing mostly Community Warfare. Um, while you stream, you know, the random drops uh, every day during the week. Uh, I absolutely 100% think both uh, pug dropping random matches and Community Warfare are viable and both warrant more development, uh, further development. I'm excited about both. I don't think you can do either one, you know, all the time. Um, I'm sure I'm, you know, to grind, you want to go back sometimes to the random pugs or whatever. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for both, for further progression and development, to make them better, to make them more exciting, um, to make them, you know, add more depth and immersion. Um, and then, of course, there's people that completely 100% play pugs and that they don't ever want to leave that. That's It's easy for them to log in, play for half hour, an hour, log out, not worry about uh, units and all that stuff. And that needs to be, um, you know, remain a focus. Now, Brandon, as far as the viable and fun, are you still finding solo and group um, fun or do you find it just sort of a release sometimes to step outside of community warfare? I mean... I think it's a bit of both. I still find it fun at times. Um, it's definitely something where I don't have to try as hard uh, as, say, like community warfare. So it's something if I do do feel like I have maybe an hour or so to play, I'll just hop in and do that. Um, definitely been playing community warfare a lot more, though, than, say, the solo and group queue, though. Now, what about you, Bears? I mean, Alex, have you guys... Obviously, you guys do community warfare, and you stream that as well. But you also stream uh, group and solo. Are you finding it still fun? Are you finding it uh, more challenging to be in community warfare and or more I, challenging to be in the pugs? I mean, the, they've done several things recently. PGI has to to make the you know CW a better environment. I mean, I know you guys have brought up faction queuing before. And it's, you know, made a made a huge difference, especially when we've got multiple allied factions with us like we do this week. We've got, uh, you know, aces with us and CI and MS. And so, you know, getting on and, and coordinating with uh, CWs is always a fun time. And it's, it's fun to drop with different people. So I can't stress enough how, you know, being able to queue with faction members is is a huge benefit. As far as, you know, standard drops go... It's a it's a good way to grind C bills still. It's a good way to grind out mechs that you don't have you know mastered yet before you go bring them to the gauntlet that is CW at the moment. Now speaking of solo groups, I'm going to bring up a topic we've talked about before, but that's also the fun part, and uh, you know it usually revolves around success. Uh, Tyler, group size. Um, you often do like on Meat Shield Mondays. You guys are usually rolling a 12 man group and stuff like that. Are, as a top tier player, do you find that? there's really not a whole lot of competition out there when you guys are rolling, even if it's a, a bigger group. Do you feel that, I guess, the current game still favors the larger groups? Yeah, the, it definitely still favors large group coordination, but we'll have VoIP arriving here soon, and that will help to an extent uh, random groups that have been thrown together. But yeah, the 12s definitely have a advantage. Sometimes just recognizing where when the enemy split or when the, there's a weak point in the enemy's line and being able to force your entire 12 man into that spot and just wreck them, then yeah, of course, being in a 12 coordinated group is definitely helpful. Ghost, do you guys have an opinion about group size? I know you guys haven't been on here, but we've talked about it a lot. Uh, just group size in the public queue, is that something that you guys have had a concern for? Do you like the current you know, um, status of it? Uh, currently, I actually enjoy it. I just think that 
like everything else within the game, nothing's perfect, you know, and people are always going to try to strive to take advantage of some of the weak points in those modes. Uh, but as far as the group size is concerned, I like the 12s. Um, should they be mixed so much with the smaller groups? Mm, I think uh, it's, it's kind of a difficult area to go into. Yeah, this is this this discussion, this topic frustrates me. Um, I mean, I I get all the logic as far as like limiting groups to to threes and fours, and we've talked about this dozens of times. I personally would like to see that. I know Phil, you would too. A, a bigger restriction on groups, um, but I think at this point that's gone. It's just not going to happen. Um, they're not going to take that away. Too many people have spoken up and said that they love twelve mans and or seven mans or nine mans or whatever, you know, however many friends they have. I think, um, you know, if there's people like us that, I don't know, I, it's just not going to happen, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. I I think that a lot of those problems will get alleviated once they introduce uh, VoIP in a command wheel, which they have said that the, uh, they're working on. So... Yep. Uh, and I, I do think that once that, that barrier of, of coordination has some more tools to help you cross it, it won't be nearly as much of an issue. I mean, there's always going to be pugs who don't listen or, or groups who want to do their own thing. But most people just, you know, they want to coordinate because coordinating helps you win. And those kinds of tools let you do that. VoIP in February confirmed. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next topic because I think this all ties in. I mean, basically what we're asking is solo group, random matches versus community warfare. Darren, you mentioned uh, you, you want to see things expanded upon. Um, you know, let's let's go to one of the pillars that MWO was built on, the whole role warfare. Um, do we have it at all? I mean, do you guys think, do is it clearly defined role warfare in MWO? Well, I'll give my opinion. Um Yes, I think we have it more than we've had it in any previous Mech Warrior game. Uh, I think lights are absolutely viable, uh, and I'm not talking about clan lights. I'm just saying lights in general. Um, clan clan lights need some love, but uh, I think the light weight class is totally viable. Mediums, heavies, assaults, some more than others, but I think we we have uh, role warfare more than we've had before. Now that being said, I think it needs to be expanded on. I think you know certain roles like maybe electronic warfare um tanking whatever um you know there's things that can be uh brought in and 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 you know define those more clearly but i think we're we're close yes and i think and hope it just keeps getting better tyler do you agree with that statement i would say in large group games the role warfare isn't as clearly defined but when you get back to the to the league play that like we just recently saw uh, steel jaguar had a couple games earlier this week and in 8v8 scouting light max it's, it all is extremely important trying to figure especially on the large maps trying to get an early read on what the enemy's doing getting a early idea of what their build is so you can prepare for the deck if you know if you see uh mechs with long range weapons you know what to expect see them with brawl weapons you know what to expect it's all extremely important not as important in 12s unfortunately so I actually think that larger group sizes kind of stifle role, role warfare to an extent and encourage more death ball gameplay. I'm going to go against the grain. I don't think role warfare is really established. Um, the main reason I say this is um, as you move up, and uh, no mech is different as far as like sensors or information or anything other than that, other than the fact of you can get modules that increase the speed, um, but every mech can do it. So a, a Atlas is the exact same as a light. The reason I bring this up is I feel like we've never actually had role warfare clearly de defined in the game. Like there's nothing saying the Raven 3L is a information, you know, warfare except for ECM, but it doesn't get any benefits outside than that. I mean, do you guys see where I'm going? Is like, well, no. Yeah. Okay. So I think we always is automatically the talk about the role or is it? But Is what are the roles? Established? We always talk about electronic warfare. I think electronic warfare on its own can be definitely needs more work. For example, a Raven or or whatever a light mech that has some electronic warfare specialties. But what other roles are we not seeing? And because we always say that we always pick the electronic warfare. What else do we need? I mean, the isn't that kind of obvious answer to go back a long, long time ago when we're still in closed beta and talking about almost individualistic pilot trees for each type of mech chassis so whereas your you know your light pilot trees would actually have specific benefits 
two light pilots that you know a medium pilot doesn't get or a heavy pilot doesn't get or an assault pilot doesn't get and make them feel like in that particular mech you know instead of speed tweak just being the generic uh you know 10 percent boost maybe for lights it's a 20 percent boost but for ha you know for assaults it's five percent and that's just you know a generic across the board you could take out speed tweak entirely for assaults and give them you know internal structure bonus of five percent once you get to the elite skills i think that would be an easy way to start at least throwing in something that makes it feel more individualized than it currently is yep i i also think that uh that weapons have a big part in in role for warfare as well i mean yes we always are, are harping on information warfare but honestly different weapon types particularly along the missile ballistic and hit scan weapon profiles directly affect how you play which is part of role warfare and this is i think you need to break it down even more between the inner sphere and the clans i think the quirk pass has done a lot to to give individual inner serum x battlefield roles that help to to foster role warfare but the clans are still i would argue there's almost no role warfare in the clan uh deck there's a very homogenous design that that works very very well and straying outside of that tends to make the gameplay experience a little bit more trying if you're uh, <laughs> attempting to do it there's no rewards for it well, I, I guess what I'm saying when I don't think it's clearly established is the fact of uh, it's it's not like it's not like you're given a mech and that me mech is unique for what it's doing other than just the equipment and weapons on it. And and I guess that's where I'm going is like even if you look at like, um, OK, the Hunchback 4G is, you know, like a brawler. Well, other than the fact of it has weapon bonuses, quirks that benefit those close range brawling. Other than that, it doesn't have anything unique. It's not like it has a faster turn rate or acceleration or electronics that, you know, nothing like that. And I guess that's where I would love, and I guess to, to sort of play the reverse side of this, this is where I feel like the game does need. And I feel like as you move up, even in community warfare, um, lights being able to actually scout um, more effectively instead death ball you know and it shouldn't just be that a, a dire wolf versus a locust a locust should be able to do things maybe with its electronics and other things that the dire wolf can't but right now that's really it's very blurry because all of them can pretty much and i guess that's where i'd like to see it expand is uh and we've talked about that before i mean do you guys have any ideas on that well can i ask a follow-up question to that phil mm -hmm. um so I know I've heard you guys talk before about, you know, specific uh, in how in tabletop there were specific manufacturers of specific, you know, weapons or specific ECM hardware or specific, you know, even Endo or Pharaoh that gave it, you know, advantages over another manufacturer. Is that something that you would like to see added where, you know, that hunchback, you know, whatever with the AC-20 has a unique AC-20 set to it? that you know no other mech gets and it's awesome because of reason x y or z or you know an ecm suite on a spider is better than one on say uh uh hellbringer because it's from a specific manufacturer and it gives x many other bonuses uh, honestly i i like the idea in theory of having manufacturer weapons and equipment in practice though i don't think it's needed and i think it just I think that's where the quirks sort of come into play and give that specific, like the hunchback, it has a unique, you know, uh, manufacturing process and design to, to, you know, launch that AC 20 a little bit quicker, further, a little bit faster and stuff like that. And the reason is, is just like weapons, the more weapons you have, the more balance issues. If you add on top of that different manufacturers and stuff, that's where I feel like the quirks sort of already do that. Um, what I would like to say is I do agree with the skill tree is if the skill tree, and that's something we'll talk about, well, I guess it's a good time to talk about it, um, is it's old. It's a dinosaur. I mean, I, how, how long ago did we talk about this? Six months? Eight? That's actually one thing I would love to see Russ you know, address on a town hall is like basically saying, hey, guys, one of the things we are going to do in 2015, along with the UI, which he already mentioned sort of on the town hall is a priority, of literally creating uh, a tree which it isn't a tree right now it's basically you have to unlock them to get the full potential out of the max oh and you have to do three of them right to be able to master an elite and all that well we literally have a skill pinpoint that isn't use it you have something in a an unlock uh, ability that isn't used now i feel like that can go back to the whole 
And I had a, I heard a great example earlier today when we were streaming. Someone said, why don't you have it so the quirks or something like the quirks, the values, whether it's generic or weapon specific, are actually part of the skill tree. So instead of it just being speed tweak and stuff like that, and all mechs have speed tweak, it depends on the chassis and it depends on the quirks they have. So for the AC-20 on the Hunchback, you would actually unlock specific ones via the tree. And I feel like, I was like, that would be great. That actually plays into the role of each mech, right? Or at least retain role. But um, Tyler, what are your thoughts on all this? It's getting a little, I don't know. I like the quirks how they are now, and that's added something to the mechs. But yeah, sure, I'd like to see mechs get more, uh, get their own skill tree even, or yeah, break it down more. It's You're right, it is a dinosaur, the current skill system, and pretty much anything would be an improvement over what we got right now. So I'm looking forward to it. Brandon, do you have any uh, you know, request with that or role warfare? How do you feel? Uh, I think just reiterating what Tyler said, I think on the smaller, when you're when you're playing with smaller teams, I think it's a lot more important than 12, but I think that's mainly not so much because of the size of the teams, but how small the maps are. Because um, with 12, you just ball up and roll, and because you're, the maps are small-ish, um, you just end up in a big brawl. Um, you don't really have to know where people are going maybe with some bigger maps like for example the um before everyone went on top of the uh the giant hill there in um i just forgot the name of the map right off the top of my head alpine. Alpine. yes alpine thank you um before that you had people scouting stuff like that even in the 12s just because of how big it was you wanted to know where they were going especially on the old uh conquest mode so I think it definitely has something to do with a combination of map size and smaller groups and that sort of thing for role warfare. Uh, but on top of that, yeah, I think the skill tree thing would definitely be an improvement as well. Having the, as we were saying in closed beta there, the defined uh, and individual and unique skill trees that a person could go into per mech. Well, someone has a good question. They says, how do you discourage murder ball and encourage more micro strategy? And I think we've got a few things here. Um, one, I feel like the lighter you are or in the specific roles, um, you need to be able to do things that the top heavy can't. So, for instance, um, if you're a locust, you should be able to lock on to things at X range, let's just say 1,200 meters, and you should be able to get sense, uh, sensor info. What is sensor info? That's where you're getting like their weapon readout, their damage and stuff like that at a good range. Let's just say one, you know, 1,000 meters a click. Well... The difference would be that uh, that Atlas or Direwolf, they can lock on at like a thousand meters. All they get is a red bracket. They don't get that info, uh, though, because their sensor range isn't that far. That's how you actually can encourage the use of lights, even on the current size of maps. Because, I mean, even the smallest map is over a kilometer or has kilometer range, uh, stuff like that. Then you encourage the whole sen uh, sensor info gathering and target info sharing with the lights and all that. That all had just has to be expanded upon. But right now, it, everything's one-to-one. -one. And I feel like I, that really hampers the lights and the mediums to an extent. I'm not saying you can't lock on at 1,000. You're just not getting that info. I mean, how often and how important is it? Oh, his right torso is crit. You know he's an XL. Go for it. Well, that changes the game if you don't have that sensor info, right? You can lock on, so it helps you aim where you're shooting and that the target's there. But you may not know where to aim. I think that uh, if we're talking about specifically trying to discourage the death ball, uh, that you have to differentiate between solo and group queue versus community warfare. Um, community warfare needs, as as um, Katra said, needs bigger maps. And there need to be objectives on those big maps that really discourage a unit from just rolling as a single large force. But compared against group and solo queue, I don't know if there's a, a, a more clear or easy way to solve that problem. The maps are going to be smaller. There isn't technically an objective that you fight over other than, say, conquest points or the base, and those are single points, and they're not even uh, the only way to win. So I think that's a much more difficult question to answer for a group and solo queue than it is for community warfare. So I, I do, I would say that I think that the role, sort of the defined role, I mean, the roles just aren't really defined very well in game. Like if a new player is coming in or maybe even a, an experienced player, you 
base of mechs roll off of the weapons and hard points, what's optimal with it, as far as like the Raven 3L, a lot of people do the year large and, you know, it's, it's there for like the skirt, you know, the harassed long range sniper while also providing ECM cover, right? But it's just not clearly defined in game. And I feel like that, that's where uh, a rework in UI and also the skill tree could definitely help people understand what role, like, oh, okay, I play the Hunchback 4G in a close range brawler sort of role with that AC20. But if I take a Goss, it's not going to be as effective. So the stuff's already in there. I just think it needs to be more, um, I guess, apparent to the user. But um, anyways, let's, yeah, yeah. let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. And this is something that I know you guys have a lot of uh, insight about. Inner sphere versus clan balance uh, as far as, uh, you know, how are things? Is it close? Is it getting better? Um, do you guys have an opinion on the quirks? Uh, Brandon? Again, what I... What I want to say is, uh, as always, I always feel like clans shouldn't really get quirks because they're cookie cutter, uh, not cookie cutter, but they're like a Swiss Army knife. Uh, as far as balance and that sort of stuff, um, I don't think it's, well, also we have to talk group Q and community warfare and community warfare. I still don't think it's there as even with quirks. Um, I mean, you can win as inner sphere versus clan with the quirks and stuff like that. Um, but you have to fight really hard. It it has to be a really hard fight on the uh, if you're IS over versus clan. Uh, as far as in the group queue though, I think there is a better balance. Tyler, your thoughts? Yeah, similar to what Catra said on the community warfare aspects. If you took like a a thirteen hundred elo that's mid elo uh, inner sphere versus thirteen hundred clan and made them fight against you, just random people in a group together, and I'm, I'm not thinking the inner sphere would win. The the clans. It's difficult to mess up a clan build. You can slap almost any set of weaponry on a clan mech, and it will be viable. Uh, the quirks are, you know, you know, much more defined. You need to go with the quirks, or your mech's not going to be as effective. But the quirks have helped to close the gap. It's just that clans still are better. I know people cry all day and night about the Thunderbolt 9S, but you can still trade with that thing. If people. <laughs> so you're basically saying that the clans are still overpowered. Yeah. Compared to the inner sphere, yes. Recently, there is kind of an official number not the thrown lights, out. Though. Yeah, not the lights. We all we all know the lights need love. Um, there was an official number, kind of unofficially uh, thrown out or given to us. It was about um, clan mechs are somewhere around plus or minus twenty percent OP over the inner sphere. Of course, there's uh, there's examples that aren't that that don't you know meet that number. But I think we're getting closer. I think there needs to be more inner sphere quirks. Um, interested to see what happens with the quirks and the clans, um, but I also think the clans just need more variety. There needs to be more clan mechs, and so I think this is going to be progressive. It's not going to change tomorrow, next week, or probably even February as, as far as becoming um, balanced. But as long as we keep taking progressive steps and getting there, uh, I'll be happy. I definitely do agree, though, that the clans are at least a little bit OP still. Well. To, to sort of also note here, we're, what we're talking about when, you know, someone may be listening, what we're talking about is if you had equal skilled pilots on both sides, right? If you take a, a, a Direwolf versus an Atlas, equally skilled pilots, and they're at long range, Direwolf has a clear um, advantage. You put them close right on top of each other. Atlas now has the advantage, right? So it, it's always one of those things, like, no matter what, if you, if it's a good pilot in it, it's probably going to do well. But what we're talking about is as you move up, those good pilots are now in mechs that do just a little bit more damage at a little bit further range and potentially uh, for a little bit less heat. Oh, and they have a little bit more armor. They're a little bit quicker. All those things add up. And uh, so that's where, you know, going back to where we've talked about community warfare, you know, who's winning, what's more important is I as a clan. And basically everyone's saying is it's based on skill. It, you know, when you get into community warfare, and that's because, again, skill is skill is the OP factor here. But if a one to one ratio, I would say the clans are still a little bit more powerful. But uh, you know, speaking of which, you guys play the clans, uh, Alex. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it, I I think it boils down to. I mean, I I gotta agree with uh, Katra and Jaeger there, where yeah, it, it's. It, the clans are just such cookie cutter. Like you can be a good pilot in a Stormcrow, and that translates over to a Hellbringer and to a Timberwolf far more than being a good 9S pilot in a Thunderbolt translates to anything else. Because 
the the bottom line with the clans is is you can bring laser vomit on just about anything and be successful. And so, you know, it's it's easier for somebody to start getting into clan mechs and find that, you know, basically, you know, the good builds, you can run them on just about anything and you can perform well in them. It doesn't require the specialization that uh, an IS player needs to be successful. I know people were asking me uh, today when I was streaming, if someone was asking if I was going to run um, like a Miss Lynx or a Clan Mech. And I was telling them, I was like, you know, I just have more fun with IS Mechs. Am I, am I the only one here? I mean, like actual fun. Like I hop into a chassis. It's fun. It's unique. I hop into Clan Mechs and it's the same, like Laser Vomit Stormcrow, Laser Vomit Timberwolf. Like I have to force myself to create builds that aren't to optimize because you literally do very very close to literally doing the exact same thing i mean it's laser vomit hellbringer laser vomit timberwolf laser vomit you know dire wolf to goss i mean i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying like from the fun factor i'm just like it's they're all the same like and it's all revolves around medium uh, lasers and stuff like do do clan er mediums just need to be nerfed like Wait, is is it so much that they need to be nerfed, or is it that, you know, the mostly worthless Clan Ultra 20 needs to be kind of brought back into something better? Because, I mean, we all know Gauze Rifles are awesome, and they're just clearly the ballistic favorite. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of incentive for a Clan pilot to bring anything other than a Gauze or Medium or lasers or Pulse lasers. It's just that there's not... It, you know, as, especially as far as CW goes, I mean, some people will bring lerms or, you know, uh, on a defense match or, you know, streaks if they're doing anti-light duty. But beyond those kind of specific roles that you only need so many pilots doing per drop, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's not much incentive to bring some of the other weapon systems that are unique to the clan, but I don't think are performing quite where they should be at the moment. And I'm not saying that, you know, that in general, that's going to make clans kind of more OP than they already are now. But I, I don't know if there's any other. It, it's just that, that the laser bombing is clearly the best way to go. Yeah, versus uh, inferior weapons, especially. You know, it's just going to be that way with the clan weapons if they don't either change the actual basic mechanics behind them or uh, or whatever. They just the weapons themselves are half of them are inferior. You have to use what works. That's that's yeah. going to be the same also for the IS stuff. I I would say I'm actually pretty happy with where clan missiles are. I personally don't like using them on clan mechs. I feel like there are better choices you can make. But I think functionally they, they fit very well against their IS counterparts. Uh, I think clan energy weapons probably could do with a little bit of, of, of toning down. I don't know how much, but they are definitely of the three weapon types by far the best choice for a clan pilot in terms of weight range and damage ratios i personally believe that they need to buff clan ballistics a little bit i don't if that's reducing the number of shots the clan ux uh bracket down to or increasing their range or velocity or something because right now for their tonnage most clan ballistic weapons are just not a good investment when com when put on a clan mech it, it, especially compared against lasers Okay, so I agree with you, but I disagree with you, and this is why. Uh, perfect example, Stormcrow, right? I can take a UAC-5 or UAC-10 on it, right? But I could also take now four ER medium lasers on that left arm with X amount of double heat sinks, four tons of weapons. Now I now have X amount of pinpoint damage, not to mention the other energy hard points. This is the problem right now with Clan Mechs. And Tyler, I mean, you've talked about it. I want your opinion on this. The issue is... I have a pinpoint, right? Hit reg, for the most part, lasers, yes, some people have issues, but for the most part, at good ranges, five, six, seven hundred meters, you you poke over, I can do a 30 or 40 pinpoint alpha damage, right? And multiple times usually, right? Well, if your enemy's carrying UACs or ACs or GOSS or LRMs, they're now they're basically trading is less effective than what you can potentially do. And this is the issue with the clan max is as soon as you buff the ultras, you've now created a monster with the direwolf with the direwolf is already a monster with UACs. So this is, it goes back to the issue of when you buff one weapon system by itself, it'll help it. But then it has inverse effects when boating comes along 
down the road. And we've seen issues with that, with the dire wolf. And there's going to be other mechs, by the way, guys. I mean, eventually. Uh, so that's where I feel like the problem is. It's laser vomit is, and that's, let's just call it laser boating. Sorry, let, laser boating. But the whole point, <laughs> by the way, yeah, Tyler was the one who came up with the whole vomit part. I remember that stream. He was like, yeah, they just like vomit all over your mech and they do 10 point, you know, 10% of damage. But that that's the issue is the weight to damage, but also how the mechanics work. Lasers are just so damn effective. And then even pulse lasers are even sh better now. I mean, Tyler, do you guys see in a, a, any other way to not create an issue? Because as soon as you buff UACs or uh, anything like that, then it, it then they start boating that because now they're just OP and, you know. I'm not going to say ghosty. So. <laughs> no, we don't need more ghosty. <laughs> Uh, she's yeah. The the dire wolf is always gonna be a major problem. It's got so many goddamn hard points that anytime you buff a weapon, it can easily boat them. Like you said, uh, energy weapons though are at a place where there is a kind of a cap to how many energy weapons you can put on your mech before it gets ridiculous with the heat. So at least the the dire wolf is capped there on lasers. It can't go crazy with the lasers because no mech can dissipate enough heat fast enough to get rid of the heat that its lasers would generate. But yeah, auto cannons, you buff them at all. And already the, you know, five UAC five people, some people like four UAC ten, those builds are already incredibly strong. To make them to make auto cannons even stronger would be ridiculous on the dire wolf. So it's a, gonna require very fine balancing. Well True, and I agree with all of that, especially when we're talking about the dire wolf. But I my concern is that the auto cannons basically un underperform on literally every clan chassis except for the dire wolf and maybe the warhawk if you're feeling adventurous i mean the the bottom so, line is you then create a system where because of one clan mech you can't fix the rest of the problems there and the, the obvious answer is to give the dire wolf a negative quirk you know give it a if it's overperforming with uac 5s uac 10s uac 20s whatever if if the general if the weapon in general, except for one platform, needs a boost to perform perfect, you know, well. And there's one mech that performs too well with it. Give that general boost and then, you know, take it a little bit back on that mech that's doing too well with it. And that way you get something more like balance. Well, see, yeah. and I, I have an issue because I've used UAC5s and 10s on clan. And I don't, individually, by themselves, with supplemental energy and missile. And they do fine. Uh, but it, it, so again... It, are they as effective as the uh, laser boating? No, but I've yeah, had so, good success with it. I want to say that, yeah, just putting a, a UAC-10 or something on your Stormcrow, you're doing as good or almost as good as most of the industry mechs with quirks, and then you're just, you just slapped a weapon on your Stormcrow. So, yes, auto, the autocannons are already really strong. I, I don't, I'm not getting that they're underpowers, that... I understand that there's more desirable choices, and maybe that's an internal balance among the clan UAC things, that the the 5 boated is just more versatile. But the 10 and 20 both work fine and better than most inner sphere mechs can possibly do. I think you hit it right there, is incentive. What incentive, and, and we're moving into the sort of the clan IS uh, balances quirks. I disagree with you brandon you you mentioned you don't think the clan should have quirks and this is why i disagree now quirks you have to be careful with uh, uh, clan max and this the, the reason being is because you can mix match omnipods and you already see it min maxing that's not a bad thing my point being though is you give uh, a mech a ballistic or an energy or missile quirk and now that mech can also boat three or four omnipods with supplemental weapons. Now you've just created a monster. It's like uh, the Storm Crow, um, you know, its left arm, if you take it, has like a negative cooldown. Well, that affects the entire mech. So that's actually a good thing. That's some forward thinking there, right? But the, the issue with the clan, I think, is you have to incentivize Thunderbolt, or not Thunderbolt, uh, Summoner. That left arm ballistic. Well, if you were to buff, let's just say, um, currently how the system is, if you were to give it a LBX 10 quirk, well, that now applies to left horse and right horse of ballistics. So unless that quirk was specific to that one location, which I would be fine with, but it would, it, engineering wise, I don't know how practical that would be. Why don't you have that for the IS sort of thing? That would probably, probably be the argument. So unless it was like localized, you now created a system where 
well, I'm just going to put the arm on. I'm not going to put a weapon on and I'll just slap the LB tens on the torso, save arm. And that's the type of thought you do have to be careful with the clan quirks is just that is the min maxing. And what can the players do? Don't think it's an issue, but you just have to have the forethought of it real quick. Just want to stick in there too, as well. Um, as far as the weapons are concerned, offensively, you know, you're just thinking about the basic mechanics of the weapons themselves while you're firing them. You're also giving yourself a lot more face time with the clan mechs versus the IS mechs. I mean, you've got the longer durations, you've got greater heat. Uh, you're allowing your enemy to hit you more. You know, you're, you're giving them a better chance of getting those high priority shots on you also while you're firing those weapons, which is taken into account in the situation as far as weapons balancing, you know, the whole duration thing and the heat thing. Uh, I think that's really pushes against the clan mechs. And, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest arguments with them is not so much necessarily the, the power that they have. I think offensively, I think that they, they work <laughs> as intended um, and, and they're fine power wise. I think it's mainly, what you give up uh, defensively as you are utilizing those weapons to the enemy. But to the counter of that, the, the reason why I, I would say I, I don't agree is because I've played clan mechs and I've been against clan mechs. Now, when a storm crow is shooting you, you have a choice. You can spread the damage, which you have more of, right? Or you try to face tank it. And from the reverse side, if they try to spread the damage, one, that's fine. You just do 10% across their entire area. Or that even if you have to pull off your burn, you're still doing equal, if not a little bit more than what an IS mech with the exact same weapons can do. Oh, not to mention you did it for the range. I mean, I can't say how many times I've looked in a general direction of a Stormcrow, Hellbringer, or Timberwolf. Looked, they barely got a shot off, and now I'm, you know there goes 10, 15% of my armor and there was no skill involved. I mean, yes, they have to hold their burn on longer, but so what? Because they're doing so much damage if you want to take that to the face. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I agree, but I, you know. But yeah, and the then the, the clan mech, mechanics, the clan mech can take your hits back on its safe XL. And because most on average uh, clan mechs, have large engines they can outmaneuver you as well and get back around the corner if they feel they're in trouble i agree yeah. with that you also One have thing... pinpoint weapons though uh you can fire on the climax back and, and be able to turn away give them less face time in return one so thing i will sell. say that i think inner Sermex do have going for them against clan mechs is that generally and this is of course not true for every mech but I would say that generally the, the hard point locations of weapons on inner sphere mechs are, are usually better than they are on clan mechs. Clan mechs weapons tend to be low slung, uh, centered on the arms, whereas inner sphere weapons are often high mounted and uh, on this, the torsos or high mounted arms like, say, the Jaeger. So inner sphere mechs are better at, at peaking and trading than clan mechs are. But again, like you guys have said, there's a serious advantages that the clans have that mitigate that. And I, I would agree. I still think that industrial mechs are the ones who ultimately uh, point for point of damage lose compared to clan mechs, especially when you take clan mechs movement profile into account. Now, I will say this about the clans. There are chassis and variants that are weak. And that's where I have no problem if they were to get quirks or at least survivability stuff to incentivize, you know, um, what we're talking about are their strongest ones, right? Timberwolf, Stormcrow, Direwolf, right? Well, what about the other ones? Uh, you know, what about structure stuff for the Adder or Kit Fox? Not saying the entire uh, mech. I'm just saying all the places it's weak. You know, Ice Ferret, all of its weapons are in its arms. You know, it, it, it relies on speed and maneuverability. Well, it doesn't have survivability. You know, Nova, what about that? You know, it's deadly if you can do damage, but it it's weak you pull off its arms you know stuff like that i mean there are certain chassis that could use some love but i do feel the balance has been closed um i would just love to see it expanded uh maybe darren you mentioned tank can you want to talk about that yeah a, a mech that's given more internal structural armor or whatever that's going to essentially fill that tank role it can't carry as much of an arsenal um you know maybe electronic warfare isn't its thing or whatever um but i mean we've talked about a few mechs that kind of seem to fit that role. So that's definitely a possibility for those. 
Yeah, I think that would be awesome. So, um, and we'll keep you guys up to date. Speaking of quirks, a lot of people ask about Pass Two. Uh, we have talked to Russ that it, you should see stuff coming out in February for the rest of you know Quirk Pass Two. For those that don't know, some of them went in prior to the holiday. Uh, Fire starters, uh, commandos, I think went in. Um, Thunderbolts were changed, dragons and stuff. But the rest of the mechs and stuff haven't. That's coming hopefully soon, so you should see that. So by the time you're listening to it, uh, to this uh, next month potentially, uh, some may be coming in or later on in February. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. I think we <laughs> talked about that for uh, uh, a while. Maps, Indeed. game modes, and max. Um, I guess what do we want to see? I mean, l- let me let me actually break that down. Um, yeah. We're just talking about roles, and we're just talking about max. We already know we've talked about game modes. We talked about what we'd love to see maps. Um, max. Are there any roles of of max, or is there any max out there that you'd like to see, but you know that actually fit a purpose uh, in, in the game? The uh, mauler, uh, because rule of cool. <laughs> the mauler because of rule of cool. Okay, there's Brandon's. <laughs> what about you, Todd? Uh, as far as pre thirty fifty three, is that where we're keeping this? Yeah, pre thirty fifty three. Well, actually, I might I might steal one from you from a couple days ago. The the devastator. It's a hundred ton mech. It has something that the current inner sphere hundred ton mechs don't have, and that is side torso one in each at least side torso ballistic mounts, which could lead to all kinds of interesting things. People could do dual gauss, dual AC twenty would be pretty interesting. So I'm looking for unique hardpoint layouts for the mechs that will be coming into the game. What about you, Darren? Is there anything that you'd love to see that isn't in video? Yes. Easy peasy. I'm all about the bushwhacker. Bushwhacker needs to be in the game now. You know, that's the first time. Is that, is that oh, 53, yeah. though? I, I don't 53, yes. 53, 53, yes. Mm. Is it? That's I'm the first not going to waste my breath. has responded without the words Marauder well, or Unseen. <laughs> come on now. Okay, Warhammer that's the first Marauder, time, Rifleman, Archer. That is but the first if we can't time get those, have, yeah. I don't know who you are anymore. Bushwhacker for its unique geometry would be pretty interesting. I'd like to see that on the field. What about the bears? What do they want to see? I am going to chime in first. I I'm going to go ahead with the inner sphere vote because I think most people already know what Mex clan players are expecting. Um, I'm going to vote for another hundred tonner. I vote for the pillager. I want the direwolf has jump jets now, so let's give the inner sphere a 100 ton battle mech that has jump jets and dual gauzes on its primary configuration. Yes. <laughs> You'll notice a lot of the IS uh, assaults in this time frame and going forward, the dual gauss setups. Uh, but yeah, the pillager would be really cool. Uh, we got a lot to choose from just to toss this out there. But I, I want to preface something. A heavy with ECM. What mechs out there in the, the IS category uh, have ECM? And um, it's tough. I, I have a stretch because it's not 30-53. But it's one all- of the... The Anvil, and it's 3055, and the Anvil is a 60 ton, has Indo, has regular armor, uh, standard engine as well, but it has Guardian ECM, it goes 86 kph, uh, two large poles, two mediums, and a ECM suit. Now, the reason I say, uh, you know, yes, it's 3055, but that's, I think, the reason, and you, you do have others out there, I'd have to do a little bit more research, but one, we've never seen that mech in the game. Um, at all so i think that would be really cool um i think there are other heavies out there the guillotine would be really cool we've never seen that as well um what about you uh sans do you get anything i already chimed in my vote oh, sorry. Was for the sorry alex sorry uh well actually i was gonna add to yours if you want something with ecm it's a bit late as far as when the uh announcement of it came out but there's a late black knight variant that has uh an ecm suite on it that you know- uh that I mean, even if you don't get the ECM suite immediately, they could. I mean, they've already said that they've given you know some of the S chassis for clans that are you know quote unquote not released yet, but they're you know being reviewed by the scientist case. So I mean, make the same thing, make it a uh, you know limited. You know, it's being run at the whatever test yards, and so everybody gets this now. How late? It's uh, from Sarna. It looks like. Dark Age was the first time you saw one. Oh, oh yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it, 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 oh, no. but you said the words. The idea. Uh, uh, dang it, Ghost. I told you. Who invited this guy? I'm sorry. I apologize. Freaking said the I DA word. Behave. No, um, how, about, how about the thug? 
I think yes, the thug would be cool. That's but an I, option. I, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, two PPCs, two SRM6, the same thing with the Hotomoto Chi. Um, it, there, there's a lot of choices out there. And I think that's what? the one thing I could stress is I would love to see mechs that we haven't seen before. Now, you did mention the Black Knight. I have nothing wrong with the Black Knight. I have something totally wrong with the MechWare 4 version. Microsoft basically took the design, did its own thing, and it, I don't know, it just, I just never liked it. I. You mean they made it look good? No, that, it, doesn't, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't look like at all like the original. I mean, but that's look, what are you thing. saying? That Alex I, is going to blow it? No, he's gonna make I, it look that's where you got one I, job, I want Alex. it to look like the medieval helmet that it is I, on a horse. Like, let's let's do it. I, I'm going to go ahead and vote that the original Black Knight artwork looks kind of like a Sentai superhero. So <laughs> I'm not really down with that. I, I mean, Alex, maybe Alex can pull it out of the fire, but... I think the original Black Knight's pretty ugly. <laughs> I think I think Alex just wants to put in like Common Rider or something like that and just call it a day. I have mm. faith in Mr. Debris. No matter what he does, it's gonna look kick ass. What about the Dervish though? Right. Ooh. Do we need any more fifty five tonners for industry? We brought yeah, it yeah. But it'll be fun. Yeah, but it's the Bushwhacker also... will be superior. Yep. But it's it's also as close as we'll get to the archer though. That's well, actually kind of what I was going for. I was going to say, there there are a few things to look at. I think we're at the point in time when, um, as far as IS, that you have to say, if we introduce this mech, one, you know, are we basically doing the exact same thing? And I think the reality of it is you are. So the one nice thing, though, is you do have the quirks. And I think the other thing that comes into the factor of is the actual physical design of it, the, the 3D model itself. And I think that that plays a huge part. I mean, look at... Look at the Miss Lynx, prime example, right? A lot of people, oh, you know, it's just Miss. It's scaled properly. It is actually tiny, and I love that. I wish the adder and the, the kit fox would have been scaled down a little bit. I mean, you see how important that is, that the actual physical scale, not to mention where the weapons are located and stuff like that. But um, some my recommendations for the mediums would be like the wolf trap, right? We, we've never seen I know it wouldn't be a favorite to everyone. The assassin. Uh, stuff like that that we haven't seen um you know the hopolite the hermes i mean of course uh, you've got the hollander i know it's a light mech technically hollander too you could always do there's a ton yep wolf found i mean there's so many mechs out there and that's what i think is cool is they're literally never going to run out of mechs they can do but we do have the enforcer coming up we have the Zeus as well, which a lot of people are wondering what the Zeus and the Enforcer, the Panther and the Grasshopper, what their quirks are going to be. Um, so, you know, I, I think you guys are going to be happy with the results. But uh, again, we're talking about Assault. This is actually something to talk about. Uh, jump Jets uh, and Highlanders and stuff. Yeah, we're going to go down this. The Highlander got changed, or I shouldn't say the Highlander got changed. The Jump Jets for the Highlander got changed. There is actually nothing behind the scenes, by the way. I did check. We talked to Russ about this. I, I did a side-by-side -side comparisons um, video footage of it. Um, that little dip is just animation. It jumps e equally jump jets. It jumps higher than the 100 ton, so it's working as intended. Are assaults supposed to, you know, what are assaults and jump jets? Is there always going to be a, a benefit to cost ratio that is good? I'm going to go ahead and say that with the current propulsion that jump jets give assaults um there's very little reason to take them with the exception of a specific number of chassis yes okay if, it, if a mech can have jump jets you usually want to have at least one on there just so it can navigate the terrain more easily um but let's compare the highlander to the banshee since they're the two closest in weight uh, the Banshee is categorically superior to the Highlander, with the single exception of jump jets, and the Highlander's jump jets just do not give it enough value to warrant taking it instead of a Banshee. Or let's say a Cyclops, if they decided to put that in the game. It's Right now, it just doesn't give value to the mech at that weight, with the thrust that it provides. What are your thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, I, I miss the old Highlander, but... Yeah, right now the Highlander is still not worth taking, even with the added maneuverability of the jump jets. Um, maybe with a few interesting quirks, we could see it again. But right now, it's yeah, the the Banshee is superior to it in just a stand and shoot kind of way. 
It's got way higher mounted weapon hard points. The the Highlander is still a great right side mounted poke mech, but other than that, it's not great anymore. What are you I miss expecting? Highlander. What are you expecting now, the Highlander though, to do the pop charting that it used to? Is that I mean, I'm asking legitimately. What what are you expecting out of a ninety or a hundred ton assault to be able to do? It doesn't have enough weapon hard points anymore. To, I mean, there are all these there's been so many new mechs, and especially with the clan mechs out now, it doesn't have the hard points to be able to throw back the damage that the other mechs are throwing at it. So yeah, it will probably need to have some kind of maneuverability advantage in order to make up for the lack of weapons that it can field. So yeah, you'd have to do, be able to do some kind of jump fighting or have significant quirks that help it out with cooldowns because it's very limited by hard points right now. Um, I'll say that we saw on the summoner an actual speed increase quirk uh, that they applied recently. And I think that something similar to that might help the Highlander out, make its torso twists better or make it move a little bit faster, which can help it uh, soak damage a little bit better than its contemporary mechs since it does have fairly decent hitboxes. Um, but yeah, without adding hard points to the mech, it's it's there's not a whole lot you can do. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, I was just curious, because, I mean, you know, you always hear, well, I'd like to take my HDNs again, but, you know, the victors are just do everything it can do and better. But that's usually just because the the jump jet. I mean, even if you were to look at it from a, a hard point and, and quirk, I don't know. I think the, the HDN could be a great, um, example of what we were talking about earlier is, you know, okay, jump jets maybe are the way they are. So it still actually gets, let's jump into Ireland and Direwolf, but you're having to sacrifice at least six tons to do it. So is that worth it? But if it was a little bit tankier, I think maybe that's where, you know, and of course the quirks always, you know, offensive uh, capabilities are always nice. But I, I just, it's always interesting because there's always something going to be better, right? Like, throw in a clan heavy that while the Timberwolf still does everything it can do and better then why even have it? Well, you know, th th I think that's always going to be the argument out there. All right, let's go ahead. We've got a few quick mentions wrapping it up here. We have the bait and switch by shimmering sword. If you haven't checked this out, it's really cool. He did another commission piece. It's of a, uh, well, a Raven being the bait and, uh, yeah, Stalker stepping in, Atlas catching a face full or chest full. Anyways, love this artwork. I love the mech porn he creates. And speaking of which, he also did a Armored uh, Combat Escalation Services Aces uh, piece of artwork. A little bit different. Um, don't recognize the mechs on that one. Brennan, do you know anything about that? They're all industrial mechs because that's all we need to beat clans. Is that right? <laughs> oh, geez. Hold on. I... Aren't you playing a clanner? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you yeah. Have ghost they offered us right a nice now, paycheck. Dude, you you're fighting for the enemy. Yeah, you're not allowed to talk anymore. Uh, we also have uh, Hefe's All About Assaults. This is freaking phenomenal. If you haven't no listened heavies. to it, just uh, I, you sir are talented, and the people you work with are amazing. We need more. I'm just saying a Top Gun parody needs to happen. Just saying, make it make it so. We also have uh, the Mercenary View and Bonding Commission. You guys know them as MRBC. Hey, I just want to give these guys a quick plug in. First off, uh, we streamed this past Sunday a match. I think there's a match tonight. Um, there, It's a league. It's a competitive league with a unique set of rules. And Tyler, you're involved with this. Um, you just want to give a brief sort of description and what's what's different and what's unique about MRBC compared to, you know, I guess, other stuff. Ah, the first thing that jumps out at me is it's 8v8 League, which a lot of leagues have experimented with 8v8 and then gone back to 12v12. Uh, I personally enjoy 8v8 much more than other uh, sizes for competitive purposes. Uh, other than that, it has some interesting drop restrictions, but it also kind of plays like a, a narrative campaign as you play through. You start out with uh, light skirmishes, no uh, artillery airstrikes available, you're far from the front lines and progresses on and on until you're looking at some really heavy mechs with all resources available to you. So the escalation is kind of interesting. You play through all five drops. It's not a, a series like a best of three or a best of uh, five, like most leagues are. So you play all five drops and based on how you perform and there's bonus objectives for each drop, you earn C bills and those are tracked throughout the entire league and whoever has the most C bills at the end wins. And congratulations, Tyler and SGR. Those were some fun matches to watch. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's actually really fun to watch. I, I enjoy watching MRPC matches um, 
because there are restrictions. While I do enjoy our haunt as well, that's basically no holds bars, bring what you will, basically, and whoever wins, wins. But there is definitely different types of gameplay and strategies used. When we did um, uh, spectate them last Sunday, first match was a, a standstill, but because you get the MRBC rules, it's actually you have to redrop, and if you lose, you actually lose more points than if you were... T- or if you draw, you lose more points than if you just lose. So, anyways, never had an issue uh, the rest of the five drops. But anyways, that's on our YouTube channel if you want to check out those fights. Definitely re- recommend it. A lot of strategies, and you're playing against some of the you know best teams out there. Um, so, anyways, check it out and register. Oh, that's another thing. It, there's different divisions for MRBC, so even a new team can come and get involved, and you just be put in a, a lower division. And based pretty much everyone that wins a division, they move up to the to the next level division after it's over. And there's I think an average of four teams for division, and you each fight each other two different times, two rounds. So everybody can go check out MRBC. Well, there you guys go. And last but definitely not least. I want to give a shout out to the TMC crew for the Urban Mech commercial. <laughs> this was flipping hilarious. Urban Mech is upon us, guys. It looks like everything uh, passed, and it, it'll be in your guys' hands under your controls in April. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of people doing some Urban Mech, uh, you know, special streams and shenanigans. Uh, NGNG may or may not be involved with any of these, so uh, we'll just leave that there. And of course, I just want to, the last plug in for quick mentions is we have the Timberwolf Grid uh, t-shirt and hoodies up for pre-order. Some of you guys, by the time you're listening to it, your chance is over. But for those that, that are here, make sure to uh, get your pre-orders in. The reason I want to bring this up is I literally get emails and PMs all the time of, hey, when are you going to be in stock with said shirt? Could be a whatever shirt or whatever. I can't stress it. Pre-order is your best way to get guaranteed your size and that you're, you're you're getting your stuff. So if you see a pre-order and you can and you want that stuff, make sure to get it in because I can't be responsible for our largest or mediums or whatever to be out of size and out of stock. But anyways, I just want to say a big thank you again to uh, the Ghost Bears. It's uh, a little bit smellier in the room, you know, but that's to be expected. <laughs> but worth and, it. And uh, of course, Ghost never have Alex on again now that after that... <laughs> Dark Age yeah, comment. Apologies. I will definitely try to keep him on a shorter leash from now on. Yeah, flog him many times. But no, seriously, guys, thank you again, Ghost, Alex, and Sands. Uh, keep up the good work. Like I said, I love listening to you guys. I think it's hilarious. Um, I think it's always great to have different perspectives, different views. And uh, I cannot stress, guys, if you're listening to our podcast, you're probably going to like what they do as well. So check them out. They're on YouTube. And, you, of course, you can listen to them live on Twitch while watching mech porn i mean there's two things podcast and mech porn they've got something going on for them so again big thank you guys and of course big thank you to our community our listeners new and old and our amazing staff you guys are awesome i uh, just want to say again without you guys we are nothing this was your local no guts no galaxy mech War podcast signing off for tonight this is phil and this is darren this is brandon also known as catcher kel this is ty this is jeremy this is greg this is the second tyler until next time, Mech Warriors. Oh shit! <laughs> I didn't say. I didn't say end this. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube at No Guts No Galaxy TV, on Twitch at NGNG TV, on Facebook at No Guts No Galaxy Podcast, on Twitter at No Guts No Galaxy, on iTunes at No Guts No Galaxy, or via your favorite podcatcher with the RSS feed at feeds.feedburner.com forward slash NGNG. It'd be best if you avoid me. But I know you probably can't You sense something is wrong with me You can feel it on my skin But there is more with it Thought it was normal 
something just a little off. The truth is, at one time I was, but now I'm a robot. Forever disconnected from you. Maybe I can be closer now, but I don't know how. Please help me remove my metal skin, my metal skin, my metal skin. And the wires within, my metal skin, my metal skin, my metal skin. Now the wires Thank you.